Okay. Okay. So it is very nice to have uh, Jaime Pineda in our virtual colloquium. Actually, we've been having pending for a few years a visit from him. And well, this doesn't count, <laughs> but at least uh, it's better than, than nothing, given the circumstances. Um, Jaime is originally from Chile. He finished his PhD at Harvard University in 2010, and then he moved to Europe, and he has been there ever after. Uh, first, he was an ESO fellow at the University of Manchester, and then he was in Zurich, in Switzerland, in ETH. And since 2014, he's part of the staff of Paola Caselli's uh, new or relatively new group, uh, the Center for Astrochemical Studies within the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics. Uh, in Garschen, Germany. He's an expert in molecular clouds, star formation, uh, young stellar objects at smaller scales, and he's an active member of several large projects with several radio telescopes, uh, some of them uh, which he will talk to us today. And the talk is ab about uh, from dense cores uh, to disks uh, following the gas. So we thank him. Okay. Thank you. Let me put the timer. Uh, there we go. So thank you, everybody, for connecting. Uh, it's a real pleasure to talk to you all. I would really love to, to, to visit and uh, to actually share some, some active discussions with uh, many of you, since we, we share so many of the, our common uh, interests. So let me, let me to, uh, tell you a little bit about this um, so it's going to contain. It's going to go from a slightly different scale, uh, starting from more or less core scales, and slowly trying to get into a bit more like this scale. So it's going to have uh, a little bit of a different scales and and physics involved, but always related to star formation. And in this case, low mass star formation. The main thing is that uh, as part of the CAN, uh, we have a, spe a special goal. The special goal is to make the best use possible of uh, the, the molecular transitions and to identify which species is good for which purpose to actually address some questions. So we, we pose a question and then we, with all the modelers around here, we also uh, come up with uh, the, the best strategies or the best uh, um, kind of uh, analysis tools to actually get to the probable best interpretation. So just as, a, uh, as an outline, I will give you some background then I will focus on the, the results from GAS, which is uh, the large program um, that's been, uh, that's it's received a, a lot of um, my, my time in the last few years. Um, then we'll just go and uh, describe a bit about the edge of the dense course and actually just go straight into angular momentum uh, and uh, how is the accretion around young sources. So just, just to begin, let me just tell you that this is one of the key results for, uh, for star formation is that molecular clouds, GMC, giant molecular clouds, are highly turbulent. So that is something that people also there in Morelia, they, they really like and love, uh, like uh, Javier and Enrique, right? So in this case, what we see here is the, the, uh, the classical result from uh, Richard Larson, where he just collected many, many of the early measurements of line widths for different clouds, and he was able to, to show that actually the, uh, there are supersonic line widths in the clouds. So if you have all the clouds that uh, they put in the catalog as a function of scale, it's a nice power law, uh, but then the marker here shows that this is the sound speed. So that, that means that all the clouds in this sample, they're highly supersonic, and they are they follow a, a, a universal relation basically. So that's Lord Larson's law. So that means that when what we know about the clouds is that they have all this supersonic turbulence. And then when we see with Herschel, we see, uh, for example, this image of uh, of Herschel by uh, Philip Andre in 2014. You see that it is not smooth. It's highly substructured. It's, uh, it, it has a lot of substructure that it was previously hidden. Uh, so in this case, this, uh, this star forming region is very active in this end, but you can see that along this, this, this region, there are filaments, there are cores, there are uh, width structures, and all of these 
could be due to the highly supersonic uh, motions inside the cloud that generates more and more so the structure. However, when we take a look at the regions that are the actual sites of uh, star formation, these are dense cores. So this is one of the most beautiful and, and studied regions in the, in, in, in the sky for, for a star formation is B68. And here what you can see is you can see the, the background stars when they're outside the core. When you look outside the core, you can see all these stars with all the colors. That means that there is no reddening applied to it. So basically you see through the, the, the region and you see a lot of, a lot of background stars. Once you get into the dense core, you have an extension and then you start to lose all the blue colors of the, of the stars. And then you, you end up with a very, very red stars, reddened stars. So that allows you to get a good estimate for what the column density due to the, due to the reddening and knowing some, something about the reddening law. And this is, it's, 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 a, it's one of the key, uh, key pieces for understanding star formation. One of the key pieces, uh, and, but we don't know how to get from the highly supersonic clouds down to these small pieces. Really, there are several questions because this is highly supersonic, but uh, cores are actually subsonic. They are very quiescent regions. So it is a bit of a mystery or a bit of a discussion about how to get from the, from the cloud to the core and what's the role of the cloud in setting up the properties for these regions. Uh, one of the key tools that uh, we've been using and people have been using to study star formation is uh, a molecule like this, like ammonia. So in this case, you can see ammonia, and it has the advantage of ammonia is that uh, it has so many hyperfine components. So in this case, the top, the top row shows the, uh, an early observation of ammonia, uh, and where you can see all these features that appear like multiple components. Actually, these are just the hyperfine components uh, from, the, from the transition line, and you can see that the model would which is a single velocity component, it can reproduce observation beautifully. So in this case, you can get a very accurate measurement of the center velocity, the line width. Okay, so it's a very good tracer for the gas kinematic. In addition, uh, ammonia has this advantage of having this, um, this, this energy, these energy populations uh, where you, you can, where you actually have metastable levels. So for each kind of, uh, in this case, for each K ladder, you have at the bottom, you have the metastable level. And the only way to move around in this, in this ladder is vertically, basically. So you, you uh, vertically is, re is the ready transition. And to move, to move in between rows, but in between columns, you need to do it through a collisional, um, collisional uh, effect. So in this case, the ratio of the different populations of the 1-1 one, one and the 2-2 two, two transitions, for example, allows you to get a very good estimate of what the kinetic temperature of the gas, because that, that uh, ratio is dominated, is, is dominated by, uh, by the collision. So in this case, we have these transitions that uh, for one observation, it allows you to get two key parameters, kinematics and the temperature. The evidence for, uh, for a stylus, for the, the course showing substantive turbulence, in addition to the individual uh, detailed observations of a single object, then there is also this large, relatively large observational uh, campaign that we, we, uh, we completed some time ago uh, with the GBT, that is the 100 meter telescope in West Virginia. Once after uh, after they rebuilt it, then they uh, they in installed the new core, the new uh, receiver, and we were and we were able to carry out uh, a, a blind survey of every single core in one of the nearby regions. And what you can see is that um, you can measure the turbulence at, for every core. And it doesn't matter if, if it is starless, as in shown in the blue colors here, or if it is protostellar, as shown in the reds here, but it's always under this solid line, basically. And that solid line shows that the non-thermal component is lower than the sound speed. So 
So all these objects, every, almost every single core in this molecular cloud showed subsonic language and the effect of the protostars are, are very minimal. So in this case, the effect of the protostar, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't move the objects beyond this, uh, this sonic regime. It's actually uh, minimum, it's a minimal effect. So in this case, this is something that is being studied and that's, and it's a very solid result. But then the question is, back again, if we have this subsonic object, how do we connect to the cloud? And in this case, these are, these are some of the observations that show that this transition is actually very sharp. So when you go back to these subsonic regions that are the seed for, for a star formation, the, the pocket where star formation is ongoing, then you are able, we're able to do math like this. This is a velocity dispersion map. That means that we're able to measure what's the, what's the amount of turbulence at each point in the sky. When we are within this orange boundary, we see that the color is very light. And in this case, it's a very low level of turbulence. Okay, so that means that the cores are subsonic. That's what we knew. However, once we go through this transition region, this orange, transition, then we can see that there is, a, that there is a, um, a sharp transition between the light color to the darker color. And that is a transition between subsonic line width to supersonic line width, showing that the transition between the cloud that is supersonic down to the core, the occurs in a very small region is probably related to some shocks. And that is also hinted by uh, uh, the, uh, the picture of uh, supersonic turbulence in clouds. If you have many shocks, then the cores can be formed as the regions where you collect several uh, shocks, and then therefore you should have sharp edges. Uh, <clears throat> but once we have cores, then the then at some point we need to make it collapse, right? So uh, this is just at the right hand side. We have a sketch, uh, a cartoon of what's going on. Uh, in the mental picture, you have a spherical cow, you have the spherical core that you make it rotate and it forms a star, it forms a disk, and has an outflow, but it's all, it's all symmetric. And that's also uh, very well uh, understood in terms of uh, um, if you have a, a dense core and you, and you make it collapse, and if, even if you have magnetic field and if you have rotation, it basically it gets flattened at the center, you get a flattened structure, and then and then you have uh, the core that collapses and makes gets dense in the central region. You have some streamlines that follow the collapse of, the, of this material. But the basic picture is that you have something that is axisymmetric. Okay, so if we are able to find evidence for uh, for changes in the in the symmetry of the of the uh, accretion of the inflow of the core. That would be something very interesting. Uh, once we're making the, the material fall into the central region, then we need to understand how the angular momentum can transport it. So this is similar to what happens in, uh, in galaxy formation. When you have galaxies and you make everything collapse, at some point you have angular momentum and the only way to um, keep the angular momentum um, in the system is to dissipate it through some torques or some other moment and some other uh, mechanism. But in this case, what is what is usually uh, what is usually proposed is that for cores, the 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 outer regions they move almost like solid body rotation, and that is basically what you see in this in this uh, solid line. So that the cores they move almost like a sphere, like a solid sphere. But then at some point, there is a uh, there, there is a break in this relation where actually gravity takes over and dominates. And since gravity is a, a conservative force, then you, you are bound to just um, conserve angular momentum. And in this case, you have a specific angular momentum that is conserved. So the, the, uh, the interest on this quantity is because this quantity J, the specific angular momentum, is directly related to disk to the maximum disk size that you can form if you are, if you are letting this material form a disk at the center. 
And it's important because once we take a look at young discs, for quite some time, it was absolutely unknown what was the uh, size of the disc in the early stages. So it's only thanks to new observations with, uh, for example, VLA in the left-hand side or with ALMA in the right-hand side, uh, thanks to unbiased surveys of uh, different of uh, protostars from different regions that we're able to find out that now most discs in the early stages are relatively small. So for example, in this case, when people study um, the dust emission, then you can clearly see that most objects that are in Perseus, they have disc sizes smaller than 12 AU. On the other hand, if you go to a region like Ophiuchus, which is also nearby, but is also very active in terms of star formation, also in continuum, but now with ALMA, uh, then people also get this estimate. And you can see that most objects, they have a, a disk radius that is less than 40 AU, less than 30 AU. So in this case, we're getting to a picture where it is more and more clear that at the beginning, in the early stages, the disks are relatively small, meaning that there is either little angular momentum in falling into the central region, or the mechanisms to remove angular momentum, they are highly efficient. So a lot of uh, a theoretical effort has been put into trying to uh, see what uh, special non-image, non-ideal MHD um, uh, terms could provide you enough dissipation of the angular momentum, for example, or of the magnetic field to uh, to get to to remove the angular momentum and end up with very small with with disks. And the, the and the concern is that actually when we take a look at much later objects. So like objects in the later stage, meaning class twos usually, that means objects that have already been, uh, that have already created all the material surrounding, and they're basically left over with the disks. Then what you see is the results from this large ALMA, uh, large program from ALMA, uh, from uh, John Andrews. In this case, you see that most objects, almost every single disk that they observe show substructure, highly, highly suggestive of planet formation. In this case, the question would be, they have big disks already at this stage, which could be related to viscous accretion, maybe, but planet formation is already ongoing. If planet formation is already ongoing, it means that the disk before this stage were big enough or massive enough to uh, enable the formation of planets. However, we, we see evidence that that is not the case. We don't see evidence of big disks most of the time. So then, then we need to go back down trying to understand if the early stage disks that we see, if, if, there's, if they have a chance to be bigger or, or not, or if we need to wait for disk spreading to actually get there. And that is related to how its angular momentum is removed. And even in the few cases where, uh, where we see evidence for big disks, then there is, there is this also this suggestive result with this a gallery of results from, uh, from ALMA that shows um, high resolution dust continuum images of disks in the Persian molecular region. And you can see that the typical separation of these objects is about uh, less, less than 300 AU. And the, the, the authors in this case, they suggest that maybe this is evidence for this fragmentation because you see many of these wispy features like these all over the place. You see features that are non uh, axisymmetric. And that would be a, 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 very, a very nice way to generate uh, to generate uh, closed binaries, but also it could imply that you have big disks early on, massive disks at least early on, and in at least a few objects. So this is a highly debated uh, topic, I would say, and that that's one of the reasons why we are uh, we're trying to to get there at some point. 
So let me just tell you that uh, I'm going to focus first in the in the early stage of the talk. It's going to be about gas. I'll just uh, this is just a collection of let's say the the largest the large scale um, maps that were available uh, in the community for for quite some time uh, of dense gas tracer in the several regions. So we have here maps in Perseus, in Orion, Taurus, and Nosyukus. This was something very uh, time consuming, and it was every map was slightly different, and it was very hard to actually intercompare the results. So what we did is we just went ahead and, and, pro, and went to the GBT and requested uh, time for a large program where we're going to do as unbiased a survey as possible, tracing the dense gas material. In this case, it was only enabled because of the uh, uh, seven pixel focal plane array that they installed at the GBT and that improved the, the speed time by uh, almost an order of magnitude. So now we were able to study the kinematics of the dense gas for many regions in a systematic fashion and uh, in regions with different levels of star formation activity, and then try to uh, try to take a look at the kinematic properties of the gas. Basically, that is the main goal, and trying to understand and see if we can shed some light onto how is the dense gas uh, being aggregated or accumulated in star forming regions. So the, the first data release happened uh, some time ago in 2017 already, and what we did was the release of four regions. Uh, Four typical uh, or very famous regions: NGC 3023 in Perseus, L1688 in Ophiuchus, B18 in Taurus, and Orion, Orion A North. And the 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 nice thing about this is that we have regions with different levels of star formation activity, different distances, and that allow us to hopefully take a look at what happens when you take a look at, at different levels of uh, at, at different kind of clouds. In a way, and see if we can, uh, if there are any trends coming from the from the environment. So these are going to be uh, initially. Um, uh, they're all going to come in the same way. For each region, I'm going to show in the left hand side the Herschel column density map, and in the right hand side, I'm going to show the ammonia results from our survey. And the contours that you see on the left-hand side are going to be the same as the contours on the right-hand side, and these are coming from ammonia. So uh, even though they look they look like the the contours match very well the the Herschel data, actually they're coming from the ammonia data. But that shows already that ammonia, in this case, is a really good tracer of the column density. But not all features seen in Herschel are also seen in ammonia. So for example, features like this, they can be, they look uh, relatively bright in Herschel, but then they are completely devoid of emission in ammonia. Or features like here, they appear in, in Herschel as comparable to some other features around here, but they don't show up in ammonia. What this shows basically is that uh, when you do when you do the analysis of the continuum, you actually need to worry about the dense gas effect um, that you're missing, that you're uh, that you're being confused because you have a, a long um, uh, material along the line of sight that is it, it has high column density but doesn't have enough density. In the case of ammonia, it only it, 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 it only allows us to trace the material if it has densities of about 10 to the fourth, because that's the order of magnitude of the, of the critical density. So below 10 to the four, no, no beyond 10 to the three, you cannot see anything with ammonia, basically. So in this case, ammonia is a very high density, it's a very good tracer for high density material. The next slides are gonna be the kinematic properties we get for this region. So in this case, you see the velocity field on the left and the velocity dispersion on the right. And uh, I want you to pay attention to the right-hand side 
and look at the colors. The color palette is going to be more or less the same across the different regions, changing the color stretch, but focus on the dark spot. You can see the dark places all over the, all over the especially over the peak of the column density, showing that those, are the, those regions, they have a very little turbulence. And it's at the peak of the of the course. Usually, you see the you see the course, and then you see uh, the supersonic uh, the supersonic cloud surrounding it a little bit. You see some filaments like this, which are uh, which are quite extended, but they're all subsonic. If we go to a slightly more um, dense region like uh, Ophiuchus, again you have the Ophiuchus map on the left, you have the uh, ammonia map on the right, and you can see. Um, that the, the, the match is again very, very good. Ex the only difference that here, we also see some extended emission uh, that is very faint. In this the first data release, we did not pursue uh, the analysis of this very low uh, brightness emission because we wanted to release something that was um, very robust, but analysis on this emission is, uh, is ongoing and uh, a couple of papers are, uh, are going to be uh, published res uh, relatively soon. And again, in this region, what you can see when you take a look at the velocity dispersion on the right, again, whenever you see a couple of contours from the uh, in the integrity intensity, you do see very dark colors in the in the velocity dispersion, meaning that they are subsonic regions. So even in these active star-forming regions, you see this transition between the supersonic cloud and the subsonic, the subsonic cores. And it's sharp. Usually it's also very sharp. Moreover, in this region in particular, you see that uh, most of the most of the cores, mo most of the subsonic cores, most of the subsonic em emission is coming from the reddish kind of components in velocity. And the extended more uh, lower density material that we see in between the cores or in the kind of in the cloud, it's more blue. And in this case, we hypothesize in, in an ongoing paper we, that we um, soon to be hopefully uh, accepted. Uh, we hypothesize that this is due to um, just cloud cloud uh, or two component collisions. So this you have one one uh, um, one component of the velocity of uh, colliding flows where one component is it gets a dense and the other just goes through. And in this case, you, you are able to, to get these two velocities. A bit more quiescent region, this is in Taurus. You can see now it is a, a bit less, it's a bit less active. You see that the emission is very sparse. And when you take a look at the velocity dispersion, again, in this very, Quiescent region, you still see again the cores that are very subsonic and the supersonic cloud that is surrounding it. So this seems to be a very systematic and, and, and general result. And finally, when we reach the the final monster in the in the cloud, I mean the survey is Orion A. Again, you see that these are very large regions. The previous best map for this cloud was in the upper north. Section. Now we just double it, more than double it, and we have um, uh, the, all this that is already public. And this is what you get in the velocity. You can see a lot of structure in the velocity field, but when you get to the velocity dispersion, surprisingly, you still see the trend that whenever you see a few contours, you see that the line width gets narrower. So even in this region, which is the farthest away, and it is the it is the uh, region of most high uh, uh, high mass stellar, uh, star formation in the sample. We still see this trend where when you see when you see a core or when you see dense material, they have uh, they have uh, gotten rid already of the turbulence. Once we stack all the parameters for all the I mean for some of the parameters for all the clouds that we analyze in this DR1, uh, we can order these regions in terms of uh, increased level of star formation. So we go from Taurus down to Orion. And in the left-hand side, you see the, the kinetic temperature that we derive from the gas. That means um, that the gas is warmer 
in regions like Orion than in regions like, like Taurus. But you see that the, the variation between um, between Taurus and Orion and it's it, it gets very it gets very smooth. So you start with very cold regions and then you start to you start to see slightly warmer gas and a little bit of the cloud in a slightly more active region. And then you start to see more of the more warm material that is surrounding it. And if you have enough density in the surrounding cloud, like in Orion, then you can see these very active and warm materials surrounding all the stuff on the region. In terms of line width, uh, you, we can also uh, take a look at the, at the histograms, the line width for the whole sample. So we just take every single pixel that we can fit and we just put it into histogram. And you can see that the subsonic cores, they clearly show up as an individual component in, the, in this distribution. However, you can see that there is this extra component that was previously, uh, it, it was only seen in, in B5. And in, in this case, this is supersonic clouds. So you see the subsonic cores and then you see the supersonic cloud next to it, showing that we have this transition to coherence uh, in all regions. And this seems to be a very a general result that the transition is sharp and it occurs at every surface region. Since we have information about the temperature, about the kinematics, then uh, kinematics of the gas, then we can do a simple video analysis. So in this case, what we did is, uh, this is a work led by uh, Helen Kirk. What we did is we just took the best catalog that we could find from the SCUBA 2 survey. And we just went for Orion because that's the one that was available at the time. We had the improved kinematics from ammonia and we had the improved temperature estimates from ammonia. So we are able to estimate a real parameter. Surprisingly, once we calculate the real parameter and we compare as a function of mass of the core, we get that most of the cores don't appear gravitationally bound. So line here, this dashed line of uh, video parameter equals to two corresponds to uh, usually the boundary of what we call a bound object at the, uh, at the bottom and an unbound object at the top. So most objects, most cores in this sample appear to be not gravitationally bound. This seems to be, uh, that, that's kind of an issue that goes uh, against uh, some of the basic things that we were we were taught when we started to study uh, star formation. We, the end scores are bound objects that are sitting there waiting for um, for some instability to occur, so then they can start uh, star formation in a way. So one thing that we did is we just also take took a look at what is the importance of the surrounding cloud as in terms of uh, pressure, external pressure, can we confine them? And in this case, uh, we did a plot where um, if you are below this horizontal line, it means that you're pressure bound. And if you are to the right of this, of this, uh, of this plot, it means that uh, when you have gravity and pressure, you are bound. So basically, this is the, this is the, the real parameter uh, Improve correction, uh, improve calculation of the real parameter if you calculate if you bring gravity and external pressure, and we see that most of them are bound, almost everything is bound. And then when we try to see what is the key to keep it bound, it is the it is the external pressure from the cloud. So then um, then we also focus. We, we, we changed focus and we went back to some of the nearby clouds and said, okay, let's focus on one of the smallest objects that we can see and let's focus on things that were missed before. So in previous survey, people always are uh, able to detect the brightest objects. So in this case, we just try to go for the, for the things that were missing before. Um, and this is uh, work by Hope Chen that uh, he led his, his work and what we did, we just, went uh, ahead and just took everything in the, in the, in the two nearby regions, in Taurus and Ophiuchus, and found objects that are subsonic. And we just 
identify those subjects and color coded in these plots, but basically were able to identify very small objects that are absolutely subsonic. And when we compare these objects with the, uh, the rest of the dense core in the, in the previous catalogs, we see that the previous cores in the catalogs are green. So they are these massive objects that are big and, they're, uh, and they follow this, this uh, mass radius relation. And then these other objects, they are down below and they quite, uh, they're, they're quite low mass. If we take a look at the um, typical uh, line width, at the typical amount of turbulence inside these objects, if we take a look at all the objects in, this, in, in the previous catalog and the new measurements, we see that they are both subsonic. So that is, that is uh, basically, that was our definition, but they are, they are more or less of the same level. And once we start to see what, are the, what is the shape of this object, what, are the, uh, what is the physical origin of this object, we need to see if they are pressure confined as before we saw in, 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 an, in Orion. In this case, we try to compare the pressure curve for each object and the density curve as a function of radius. And one of the key uh, kind of uh, fundamental models for cores is that um, if you can keep them pressure confined, then they are very well approximated by what's called a Bonner a Bonner Everett solution. So that is the solid the solid line. And you can see that for all these objects, both the, the pressure looks a bit similar uh, to the data, but the density is completely different to what we see. So in this case, it does show that uh, these objects are not the typical standard bottom ever sphere. So to, when you begin with these small objects, they are not, they are not uh, bottom ever spheres. And once, when we take a look and we try to see if these objects are, are, are gravitationally bound, if we try to look something like the, to the viral parameter, um, this is a, another way to plot the viral parameter. If you are below this red line, then you are not bound. If you are uh, above this, uh, this, this line, then you're gravitationally bound. And in this case, it clearly shows that uh, all these objects, all these new objects, they're mostly pressure confined. They don't have enough mass to actually keep it bound. Uh, it's only when we combine both gravity and pressure that when we compare to kinetic energy that we can see that they are in the, in the bound regime. But it's all, it's all dominated by external pressure. So in this case, we're taking a look at objects that are the smallest in the cloud and that are not bound, but they're much smaller mass. And maybe there is a trend here. Maybe they can grow to go to a higher mass by accretion to the edge. Uh, now, once we start to go, um, uh, now let, let me go to a specific angular momentum. Uh, this is the key plot going back to the introduction is that we're, I want the, the main result was trying to see if we can determine um, when is this break occurring in the data set? When, in, when do you see this uh, region of a conserved angular momentum? And is this solid body rotation approximation appropriate? It is important to check that because also this is, this is one of the basic parameters for all numerical simulations of disk formation. Okay. Uh, so some hint appears from uh, some early work of a single course where it shows that the uh, a specific angular, the total specific angular momentum for a single core seems to be correlated with the size of the core to some power that is not consi consistent with uh, solid body rotation. However, this was a bit disregarded because it, it was not super clear from this sample because there were uh, very correlated measurements. So what we did, we just went to, uh, to the VLA and we observed with ammonia, three very young objects, three class zero objects. In this case, this is even a first place core candidate. And the, what we'll show is the ammonia integrated intensity and the velocity map and the outflow direction here. And then you can see that there is a clear gradient. So we can actually measure what the amount of angular momentum is at each position. Then we see this other famous object, H H211. Again, it has some uh, rotation, and these other a bit more confusing uh, 
also has some rotation on some component that is perpendicular to it. But what we did is we just put together all these measurements and were able to be uh, to resolve the specific angular momentum radio profile for the first time in this kind of object for the envelope. And you can see that for the three objects, there are the three objects in pursuit, and we put them all together and were able to estimate the specific angular momentum radio profile, and they both, all of them line up very nicely. In comparison, you see here the previous curve from uh, Beloche, uh, and you can see that it doesn't match at all. So at any, for example, at 10,000 AU scale, we measure a lot more angular momentum. However, we don't see this transition, and there is, uh, we don't see this transition to conserve a specific angular momentum until we're very deep in, where there is maybe a hint of a conserved angular momentum, maybe within a thousand AU. But the sizes that we, that, we, uh, that we allow for the material, if it goes straight to form a disk from this region and conserve angular momentum, is of about disks of less than 80 AU in radius. So there is no chance for these objects to, to form a, a big, Keplerian disk early on. And when we try to see what happens in, uh, in young protostars in, from simulations, we, we see, um, we try to do the same comparison. And basically, if we have uh, HD simulations, the blue and the orange here, they are completely off the mark. And then the non ideal image D is the one that's able to, to reproduce at least the slope and the amplitude a bit more. Once we get to another kind of a simulation, we will also take a look and seeing uh, in a simulation where the disk is already formed, uh, you can see that the slopes of these of this, uh, envelopes are very different to what we measure. It is much flatter and it is much more consistent to what's seen in a more evolved object. So in this case, it suggests that actually what we're seeing is an uh, evolution of the angular momentum profile. So early on, we could see something steep like this without um, without a, a, a transition uh, to, to conserve angular momentum until further inside the core, while when you are much later on, then you, you have a lot of angular momentum that is being deposited in the early in the, uh, regions. And just the last couple of slides, um, just focusing again on the accretion process. So what we want to take a look is, uh, we want to see what happens in a, in a young object. In this case, a class zero. This is a Barnard, a Barnard wine uh, region in Perseus. Um, we're going to focus on this region. Uh, this is the image that we get from Scuba. So that means it's a very point like object, nothing really special. And you, you can see here the contours that are coming from uh, basically from the ALMA data uh, from John Tobin. In this case, you can see that there is a very interesting hint for, for uh, feather like a spiral, uh, frag, uh, the, the hint for uh, fragmenting disk in this case. What we did is we went to Noema. Uh, thanks to the new correlator, we're able to do things that we couldn't do before. And in this case, it's just look at a bunch of lines simultaneously. So in this case, we went for this object and we observed it in many lines. And in this case, this is in a HC3N, What's important is this is fresh material. It has a lot of carbon. If the, co if the material in the, in the gas phase, it's, it gets into a region that is dense enough for a sufficient amount of time, all these molecules will disappear from the gas phase and we would not see this kind of structure. That means that this material that we see here is very fresh. And once we take a look at the, uh, once we take a look at other, uh, at other species of stars simultaneously, you see that there is this, uh, this clear streamer, there is a streamer of chemically fresh material getting into the central region. Could it be, could it be related to the feather-like structure? So could it be related to these uh, um, uh, non-symmetrical features in the disk? That's something we don't know. But what we know is that the kinematical properties of this material traced by this HC3N line. Uh, it shows a clear, smooth velocity gradient and very narrow line widths, meaning that this is not affected by the outflow. The outflow goes in this direction, 
And when, once uh, we try to model both the morphology, in this case, and the velocity as a function of projected distance uh, as a free-falling streamer, the match is pretty good. So in this case, morphologically, the position of the sky, but also the, um, the velocity as a function of uh, projected distance, it, it is a very good match. We estimate that the mass in this streamer is at least 0.1 solar masses. The free fall time is of order 10 to the five uh, years, meaning that we have an accretion rate from the streamer of about 10 to the minus six solar masses per year. If we compare to the accretion rate that it's estimated right now for this protostar from uh, modeling the SAD, we get uh, of order uh, seven times to the minus seven solar masses per year. So there is more material falling in into streamer than what is falling onto the protostar. So this means that actually we might be seeing some of the um, some of the early stages for um, uh, of of, of uh, asymmetric accretion on this on this object, and that can it can do two things: it can increase the accretion rate substantially in the central region, but also it can change it can change the chemical composition of the of the disk or the inner region. Because those are the regions that we care for disk formation or for plant formation in the future, then this is a very, very uh, exciting new result that should be published in a, a month or so. So I'm running out of time, so I'll just leave you with uh, the summary. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jaime. Very nice talk. So uh, do we have any questions? Uh, can, we, can I see some hands, please? Okay, Enrique, go ahead. Hola, Jaime. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Hola, Enrique. So, uh, very, uh, nice talk. Uh, very interesting. Uh, welcome to have you. Good to have you talking to us. Uh, well, uh, as you might, might imagine, I have lots of questions, but my first one, I'll let other people ask other questions and then maybe I'll come back. Uh, when you talk about the, the pressure, uh, confinement of the cores. How do you make? How do you measure the pressure? Uh, the, and the the main point of my question is: Can it be ram pressure of infalling material from the outside, or does it have to be thermal pressure of hydrostatic mm -hmm. material? So the, there are two two estimates for the one that we have in um, in the case of Orion. Mm -hmm. Basically, we also try to estimate the pressure outside based on the line width outside but it's very little mm -hmm. so if we t we have the core and outside we estimate what's the line width increase uh, in line width gives you kind of the, the ramp pressure outside it's not enough it's mostly due to the bound of uh, pressure i mean the bound uh, the pressure due to the kind of the, the weight of the cloud uh, if you mm -hmm. if you follow more or less like um, what Doc johnson uh, was proposing some time ago uh, if you go to some of these results, like uh, what we have with um, with Hope Chen, uh, we are we have a different approach because it's nearby, so we can actually get a density and a line width profile for every single object. Mm -hmm. So we're able uh, we're able to plot the pressure as a function of radius mm -hmm. for all of these objects, and um, also color code them. In this case. The bluer it is, the more gravitationally bound it is. Mm -hmm. And the ones that are red are very uh, unstable in a way. Mm -hmm. What you can see is that uh, there is a huge bump in the pressure in these red objects, mm -hmm. for example. And if you go to the density profile, that is not due to the increase in density. That is just due to increasing the line width right outside. So in mm -hmm. this case, it is possible that this these uh, cores, when they form, they are very little and they are very, I mean, they don't have enough mass to be bound, mm -hmm. uh, but then they keep accreting and they, accreting very, they are accreting very fast and that could be a way to uh, move them into the more stable regime and to become a real core. Mm -hmm. In this case, they are still in the 
in the in the infant in the infant phase. Okay. Okay. So you, more or less uh, answer the question. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, so basically, you use the line width which means it's a total line width, uh, so including the actual velocity dispersion. And so if, if like us, uh, you think the line width can be interpreted as relating to infall, then that could be pressure, like ramp pressure from infalling material from the outside. Is that correct? If you're able to do it in a region that is small enough uh, with the densities that are High enough so you can see it in ammonia. Absolutely. I mean, in this mm -hmm. case, we don't have. Um, there is no way we can say that this is uh, ramp pressure. Absolutely, so, uh, we cannot. We cannot rule it out. Uh, okay. We only know that there is an extra pressure outside, and it's likely that these guys they are all just pressure confined, uh, but they are not in equilibrium. Mm -hmm. They're clearly not in equilibrium. They don't follow the bottom ever sphere profile. Okay. That they are highly out of equilibrium. That's, I think, the key part. Great. Thank you. So uh, I'll let somebody else ask and raise my hand again. <laughs> That's going to be clear. Um, let's see, uh, Javier and then Roberto. Javier, go ahead. Uh, so, sorry. <laughs> So thank you for the, for the interesting talk, uh, Jaime. Uh, and I guess Roberto was before me, uh, by the way, but anyway. Uh, in, in this plot that you showed, uh, when you estimate the, 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 the pressure in the, in the outside of the core, how homogeneous is it? I mean, are there many, uh, is it strongly fluctuating around? Because you are just showing here uh -huh, an average uh, around it. Fair enough. So in this case, uh, let me just go to, 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 to here. So for example, this is basically the region, one of the key regions where we're getting many of the measurements for the uh, pressure for this course that we saw. So in this case, I'm not going to talk about uh, Orion because that is too far away. We not really do the detailed work, but we can do it here in Ophiuchus and we can do it in, in Torps. So you can see that uh, for example, around this core, you have uh, the, the core. The color inside is very uniform, and outside there is, there is some fluctuation, but it's not a large fluctuation. There are some other regions, like here, where there is a clear um, increase in the line width that is asymmetric. There is one side that is a, a lot brighter than the other side. I mean, that the line width in this northern section. It is much, much, much larger than what we estimate on the other side. So it, it, in a way, it depends in some in, in the regions. But I would say, on average, the amount of line width that we measure is relatively uniform across the cloud. Once you get outside the core, it basically it stabilizes and it gets to kind of a mean value. Okay. Like this. So you see that here the line width, it has a, it has a large broad value, but when you took when you take a look locally, you see that uh, around the course it is basically a order 0.4, and these very large values in detail are coming from regions either affected by um, uh, like here at the edge, affected by a, a ionizing source, very active star, form star formation. Some or some random uh, some pixels that we think there are two components on the line of sight. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Javier. Roberto. Uh, yes, uh, thanks, Jaime. So um, I I've been often confused with this. Uh, so let me see if if you can help me. So so you are finding that uh, cores in low mass star formation regions and even all the way to Orion have uh, 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 turbulent subsonic motions no? and in general they are they are uh, they, they have a small line width but on the yeah. other hand uh, on the other hand there are some studies that uh, observe high mass star forming regions at kiloparsec distances and they find a population of course that are supersonic 
uh, although very often super critical, no? they are su su uh, uh, supersonic and super critical. No? So how do you put these two things together, given that uh, you are uh, reaching all the way to Orion that has some high mass cores? So could it be that those cores and your cores are not the same thing? Um, the, 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 the order of magnitude different distance is making something that maybe <laughs> If you observe those those faraway objects, they will fragment into smaller entities. Or, or so what's the? Yeah. So w one thing that, um, for example, I can say is that yes, of course, Orion is high mass ish, right? So it's not really high mass, but it's getting there. It has some high mass objects, uh, and when you take a look at the line width in the in the really active region, probably where what you would call the high mass region is very supersonic, right? It's this part, right? If you take a look at the at some of the other regions, then uh, we are, in this case, we're absolutely dominated by uh, confusion because uh, we have the, uh, the analysis that we also did with, um, with Christina Monsch using VLA data on, on this central region. And what we can see is that uh, if we if we if we have VLA data, uh, even if they don't have enough angular, even if they don't have enough spectral resolution, we do see that we can disentangle different features along the line of sight. That previously they were all blended into a single component. Now they uh, they appear into a couple of uh, features, like a couple of filaments, um, parallel on the on the sky, but they were all within one GBT beam in the previous observation. So, and in those observations, we're able to see a <coughs> decrease in the line width. And it doesn't get to subsonic because we don't have enough spectral resolution in that case, but getting to a narrower line width, I think it's enough for me. Um, I don't think that this has to be uh, something that will happen all across the star forming regions because high mass, there are slightly different uh, regime of densities and level of turbulence. However, I would say that in an intermediate region, like an IRDC, we, it's the only region where I think we have, we have done a good enough study uh, with, with, an, with sufficient spectral resolution and angular resolution to actually start to see regions of subsonic line width. And in that case, they, they appear. There is a work with uh, Vlad Sokolov, a student of, of us that we published and were able to see that there are uh, some regions, it's not throughout the cloud, but there are some regions, some kind of cores where they do show subsonic line width. Okay, but then do you think that those uh, observation, observations in far away high mass from regions, do you think they are confused? In some, in some <laughs> cases they, they are, but in some other cases, I mean, one, once the region is very active and you have a, uh, you have already ultra compact H2 regions in the in the neighborhood, and it's completely different to what we see in in low mass right. information. And I, it's likely that there is not enough um, there is there is not enough a dynamic range to really decay the turbulence at the level that we need. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Roberto. Um, so it's one o'clock. Uh, I suggest we thank the speaker and then we can have some brief discussion because I know Enrique has questions as well. Okay. So uh, thank you very much, Jaime. Thanks again. Okay.